The Gith can cause quite a bit of confusion, as is the name of a race that is split to two distinct factions, the Gith Yankee and the Gith Sarai. They share a common background and history, escaping from the control of the Mind Flayers, but tensions within split the race into two, with one living in the astral plane and the other residing in the ever-changing chaos of Limbo. This split caused them to hate each other, hunting each other and the Mind Flayers who enslaved them without mercy. Why the split, though? Well, we'll find out soon enough. The Gith make their debut in the Fiend Folio, 1981, and were quite the powerful foes to face off against. The Gith were once evil humans that the Mind Flayers captured and enslaved using their psionic powers. They were held in bondage for untold eons until they developed their own powers and abilities to escape the control of the Mind Flayers. The one who led this bloody revolution against their masters was known as Gith, and so the entire race named themselves the Gith in honor of their rebellion leader. There is little information explaining exactly why the two branches of the Gith split, but they have hated each other since the beginning and are in Gith Yankee Gith Sarai War. Of course, that doesn't take up their whole attention. The Gith Yankee, who reside on the astral plane, love to kill Mind Flayers and humans. We understand the Mind Flayers, and if we were psionically enslaved for eons, we'd probably want to start cutting off tentacle heads too. But their absolute hatred for humans seems weird. Maybe it's just they were originally evil humans and old habits die hard. The Gith Zarai, who reside in Limbo, are not as excited about killing Mind Flayers and often have an on-again, off-again truce with them, with few skirmishes here and there. We are kind of on the side of the Gith Yankee in this situation, but at least the Gith Sarai won't immediately kill you if you're human. Both of the Gith have layers on the material plane, though they prefer living outside of it. The Gith Sarai reside on the outer plane of Limbo, rarely traveling from their massive adamantine strongholds. Gith Yankee reside in the astral plane, an imposing castle ruled over by supreme leaders who have a very strict cap on how powerful they are. You might wonder why they are only allowed to get so strong, and it's because they have a queen who hates the idea of sharing. Known as the Lich Queen, she is said to kill anyone who gets too powerful, so that none can threaten her rule over the Githian. Before we talk about the differences, let's first go over what they share. They are both people gifted with psionics, as in everyone who can call themselves a Gith can use psionics. The Gith Zarai are only slightly stronger than the other when it comes to using their mind to blow your head off, but it's pretty close as they only get an additional defense mode that relies on their super ego to build an unassailable haven for the brain. Apart from vaguely written psionic rules, the Gith can also plane shift onto the material plane where they construct lairs and go out in small patrols throughout the subterranean tunnels where they prefer to reside. Let's now take a look at what makes them unique. The Gith Yankee are warriors and focus on being fighters and magic, although the most powerful among them are anti-paladins who are known as knights. They can easily be spotted because they all wear armor and wield swords, and as they get stronger and more important to their supreme leader, the nicer the equipment they get. The strongest among them are given a signature weapon of the Gith Yankee, a silver sword. These silver swords are plus three two-handed swords, which, when used against a creature who projected into the astral plane, has a one in five chance of cutting their silver cord and killing them instantly. It's a bit fancier than a simple silver sword an adventurer might pick up to kill a lycanthrope. And if a Gith Yankee is killed and their sword is stolen, the thief will be hunted down across the plane. You might be thinking that you can take on a few Gith Yankee knights, especially since the Lich Queen kills the strongest among them before they can get past 11th level fighter, but you forget that a knight needs a steed. You might be ready for a horse, but you definitely aren't ready for a red dragon. In return for a place to live and lots of treasure, red dragons serve as Gith Yankee mounts on the material plane and act as transports for their troops. Ancient and old red dragons serve loyally, offering their firepower when it comes to helping out the Gith Yankee and the destruction of all humans and mindful. Looking at the Gith Sarai, they aren't quite as fearsome as their kin since they don't get dragon mount, but they are still powerful adversaries. They are focused on being more monastic warriors with simpler weapons and garb. While they are still focused on being fighters or magic users, there's a chance you can stumble across a powerful monk Gith Sarai. Of course, much like how the Gith Yankee have a Lich Queen to ensure that no one gets too uppity, the Gith Sarai have an undying Wizard King who allows his followers to get up to 16th level as fighter instead of 11th level, or 23rd level as a magic user instead of 9th level before he starts killing people. Maybe they have more in common than we originally thought. The Gith take a sudden turn in 2nd edition, and a new form of Gith is introduced before the others in the monstrous compendium Spelljammer Appendix in 1990 with the Pirate of Gith. The Pirates of Gith are cool individuals who, instead of escaping to the astral plane or limbo, ran off to the arcane space, the void between the worlds of the material plane and the Spelljammer campaign setting. The Pirates like to cruise around in Spelljammers, taking what they want, when they want, and from whomever they want in wild space, often making their lairs inside of asteroids. They believe only the strong will survive, and are noted to be solely carnivores who don't much care how they consume their meat, so long as it isn't petrified into stone. They are so hateful of vegetables that they'll even go so far as to eat their own kind. While they lack psionic attack forms like their kin, they do have a few abilities that allow them to plane shift and use ESP. 
They don't create their own spell jammers, but rather steal other races' ships. Their preferred ships are the ones created by the elves because they are living ships that can be affected by their psionics, allowing them to plane shift the entire ship into the astral plane, which is a common tactic for them when things turn against them in combat. It's not until the release of the Monstrous Manual in 1993 where the Gith are explored and features the Gith, a reprint of the Pirate of Gith, the Gith Yankee, and the Gith Zerai. Yes, you heard that right. The Gith are completely separate from the Gith Yankee and the Gith Sarai and is not looking right for this fractured race as a whole. The Gith are described as grotesque humanoids that look like an elf and a reptile got down and dirty. They seem to be an outlier compared to the others as there is no mention of an escape from enslavement by the Mind Flayers and if it wasn't for the creature being called the Gith, one might think they have no relation to the others at all. In fact, they are actually the ancient descendants of the Gith Yankee in the Dark Sun setting, though that isn't revealed until a year later in 1994 with the Dark Spine Adventure. They are hunched over humanoids with deformed hands with only three fingers and a thumb with sharp claws. Their preferred weapon of choice is to use special spears that are tipped with obsidian to hack and slash their way through their enemies often employing the strategy of more is better as opposed to any actual strategy. We do see a slight similarity with the rest of their kin as they use psionics, though they are fairly weak at it. Only most powerful of their kind get psionics, with the strongest among them becoming the leader of their tribes. That's about the extent of their similarities as the rest of their society is strange. They are known to reproduce by laying eggs, with females laying up to six eggs in a clutch, and that the gith watch over hatcheries containing hundreds or thousands of nests of their kind. With so many young to feed, you have to wonder what they eat. Much like the pirate of the gith, they are solely carnivores eating any living creature they can find, though they prefer to eat the flesh of humans and demi-humans above all else. Going back to the well-known Gith, the Gith Yankee, and the Gith Sarai, not much changes from the previous edition. Gith Yankee are the sadistic and cruel warrior race of the Gith, and they are, or at least were, the most loyal to Gith, the one who freed them from the Mind Flayer. In fact, their name, Gith Yankee, means Sons of Gith. There's no mention of what happened to this Gith, though their Lich Queen is never named, instead she's merely a cruel demigoddess that drains the most powerful Gith Yankee of their life force. It wouldn't be the most ridiculous idea to think that Gith is their Lich Queen, though it's never said or hinted at beyond the fact that Gith is now specifically called a female. To go along with the normal lore of the Gith Yankee, we are also given a detailed look at the Gith Yankee ecology and there's no mention of them laying eggs. There are highly valued roles within their society thanks to the strange effects of the astral plane. The Glathic are farmers who must try and grow all sorts of crops in the astral plane basically a giant void that isn't very conducive to growing crops. After them are the Malar, who wield magic not to destroy, but to build. They are responsible for the strange structures and buildings that make up the Gith Yankee cities and layers, using their magic to create strange architecture. The final specialized group are the Harakmir, who have an affinity for the psychic powers that flow through the astral plane and all the other weird energy that goes along with an endless black void. The Harakanar can harness these exotic energies, augmenting them in different ways to help them further their craft. Though what their craft is, isn't mentioned. We are just led to assume the Harakanar can occupy any role in a Gith Yankee society. The Gith Zorai are the last of the Gith and are more human-like in appearance and are the only ones who aren't evil and are described with Caucasian skin, so that's not great. The Gith Sarai formed after Gith freed them from the Mind Flayers, but their founder, Zithermon, thought she was too cruel to be a proper leader. While Zithermon would die in battle, it was his sacrifice that freed them from the control of Gith. Many of the Gith Sarai believe this is the moment when Zithermon ascended to godhood and they are waiting for his return when he would usher them all to a new paradise. This religion is led by the Zerfs who see themselves as the true believers of their god. The problem is that until he returns, they will be persecuted by the wizard king that rules over them. This guy still doesn't let anyone grow too powerful to challenge his authority, and having a god arrive to take his people home probably wouldn't be a great thing for him. He has tried in the past to remove the idea of the Zerfs and Zerthamon, but it always comes back. The Gith Sarai now have a special forces unit that seeks out and assassinates mind flayers throughout the plains, so it looks like their peace with the mind flayers has finally ended. 
you'd think that'd make the Gith Yankee happier with them. Name the Rachma, they are well trained and serve one purpose, eliminate all mind flares. The Gith Zerai see the Lithids as the root cause behind the split of the Gith, thus cursing them to the bitter war that has raged ever since their liberation. They are highly respected within Gith Zerai society and only the strongest among them have any hope of joining. A bit more information is given on the Githsarai in the Plains of Chaos in 1994, a sourcebook for the chaotic outer planes like the Abyss, Pandemonium, and Limbo, where the Githsarai have set up their cities. The most interesting thing revealed is that their Wizard King is given a name and several titles. Known as God King or Great Githsarai, Zarith Minyar Agith resides in Shreklor, where he watches over the city and the generals who plan attacks on the Gith Yankee to make sure their rivals never grow in enough power to wipe them all out. In the book A Guide to the Astral Plane released in 1996, the Gith Yankee are the Astral Plane's featured inhabitant. More information is provided on the deal between Gith Yankee and the Red Dragons and is the reason why Gith, the savior of the Gith people, is no longer in the picture and it turns out she didn't become the Lich Queen that is currently running things. Gith had an apprentice, Vlakith, who tried to help her make a deal with the Slotty so that they might decimate and slaughter the Gith Sarai who escaped to Limbo. Unfortunately for Gith, it failed, but Vlakith had another idea. If Gith descended into the Nine Hells, she could approach Tiamat with an offer. Gith did just that, speaking to Tiamat and Tiamat's consort, a red great worm named Ephelamon. No one knows what deal was struck, but Gith was never seen again and Iflamon announced to Vlakith that Gith wanted her to lead and take over the direction of the Gith Yankee to further their empire across the multiverse with the help of red dragons. There are a few other exciting things to learn in the book, like the origin of the Gish, the Gith Yankee fighter wizard multiclass who holds a high standing in Gith Yankee society. Their astral home is detailed, known as Tunarath, it resides in the body of a long dead god whose corpse floats endlessly in the deep astral plane. They have a wide variety of unique spells that they have created to help them survive the dangers of the astral plane, like a spell that stops them from aging whenever they exit it. The last bit from this book is that Lich Queen isn't Vlakith, but rather a descendant of hers. The Gith Yankee served their queen without hesitation, following her guidance like fanatic worshippers of a god or cult leader. Some compare this devout relationship to that of slave and master, finding it odd that the Gith Yankee would be so willing to put themselves in a position where part of their individuality is removed from them. There's plenty more to discover about the Gith Yankee in this book, and those who really want to dive into every aspect of Gith Yankee life would do well to find a copy. The Gith Yankee and Gith Sarai first show up in the 2001 Psionics Handbook and are reprinted in the Manual of the Planes and the 3.5e Monster Manual. This edition only features the two Gith who are at odds with each other, leaving the Pirate of the Gith and the Gith behind them. Little changes for these militant races. They hate each other, they hate mind flayers, Gith Yankee love decorating their armor in gems and beads, and the Gith Sarai think that the Gith Yankee are just evil marauders who must be stopped. The Gith Yankee are still ferocious warriors, but it's taken a step forward in that they are so singularly focused on warfare that they spend more time focusing and lovingly taking care of their armor and weapons than they do their mates. Maybe their mates are equally career oriented, and this is fine within their society, but we couldn't imagine doing the same and having our spouses be very happy. Their combat techniques include ambushing their prey and using their psionic ability to brain melt their enemy. They prefer fighting in melee combat, and they still wield silver swords, but now they appear like liquid silver when drawn. These weapons require an expert to even wield them right, as the blade's shape flows and shimmers while they are fighting. They can use these blades to either murder you or cut your silver cord if you happen to be astrally projected to the astral plane. If they only damage your cord, you must succeed on a low fortitude saving throw or be yanked back to your body on the material plane, which isn't the worst option. If they sever the cord, then it's game over, and you die in the astral plane, and your body dies on the material. The Giths Arai reside in their fortress monasteries in the Limbo, where they train their mind and body, honing them into a lethal fourth so that no Giths Arai ever need to fear being oppressed or enslaved. These monks are continuing the war against the Gith Yankee and the Mind Flayers, relying more on psionics and their natural talents instead of using armor and weapon when they fight. Before we move too deep into 3.5e, the Gith Sarai appear in Dragon Magazine number 281, 
the same month that the Psionic Handbook is released. The article, Calm Amid the Storm by Bruce R. Cordell, is a teaser for their new source book on psionics and dives deep into the life in Gith Zarai monasteries as well as featuring two prestige classes that a DM could give a Gith Zarai or offer to a player if they can brave the dangers of Limbo. There are dozens or maybe hundreds of hidden monasteries in Limbo and the Gith Zarai do not automatically join a monastery at birth. Instead, they must seek out these monasteries, either by word of mouth or by researching in dusty old libraries. Those Giths Sarai who do decide to join a monastery, as many are commoners who reside in the cities of Limbo, must prove themselves to the monastery by taking on quests or tasks. Even outsiders are allowed to join certain monasteries, but must prove themselves also. This test could be taking down a chaos beast, killing a gang of slad, or some other task the monastery sets in place for you. Upon completion, you are allowed to join and must spend several months training in the monastery before you are one of them and can get access to the prestige class of that monastery. The two monasteries presented in this article are the Monastery of Zerth Adlon and the Monastery of Finitalon. Zerth Adlon is a well-respected and well-known monastery that is easy to find due to how prestigious it is. Monks who succeed at this monastery are known as Zerth Cenobites, where they follow the rule of Zerth Adlon called Zerthen. It is a practice of peering into the future and enhancing one's martial abilities. They can step forward in time, stop their body from aging, and grant themselves a bonus to their attack rolls as they can see their opponents next. Finithamon, on the other hand, is a very secretive monastery with almost no living Gith Sarai ever hearing about it, and those that have assume it has been destroyed decades. The monks attempt to learn the teaching of Archelos, a method of fighting and slaying spellcasters. They can strike out with their body, causing spellcasters to become mute or deaf, make casters forget their spells, and even redirect spells back at the caster. They see the chaos of Limbo as the same chaos that wizards and sorcerers command, and their triumph over Limbo is their triumph over spellcast. The Gith Sarai continue to get some love as more information on them is in The Killing Cousins by Chris Thomason in Dragon Magazine 306. In this article, it details the Gith Atala, those select few Gith Sarai who specifically hunt down the Gith Yankee instead of the Rakama who hunt down the Illithid. The Gith Atala are a secretive group who prefer to stick to the shadows and watch the Gith Yankee from afar before making an attack, striking when their prey is at their weakest and when they can do the most damage. They don't often attack their cousins unless they are sure of the outcome of the battle, as they are a small organization with a limited number and losing a single strike force can be devastating to their ultimate goals. To go along with the Gith Atala, the article also provides weapons, items, feats, and player character information to play at the Gith Sarai, which involves you skipping certain class levels and gaining Gith Sarai powers so that you are not too powerful compared to the rest of your group. A starting Gith Sarai character gains a plus two boost to the dexterity, but takes a minus two blow to their intelligence, which is a bit rude. Nowhere have we read that the Gith Sarai lacked intelligence or that they were dumb. They have been portrayed as these great sages, which harkens back to wisdom. But still, not to be outdone, the Gith Yankee appear in Dragon Magazine 309 in a mega article Incursion, A World Under Sea, where they are given a 30 plus page expose on how to incorporate the Gith Yankee Incursion in the material world of your campaign, detailing likely plot elements that can arise in such a campaign. Starting with the basics of why the Gith Yankee are attacking, maybe because they wish to retake their old home world that the Mind Flayers took from them. Or maybe they wish to completely wipe out the Illithid on a world and just see the surface dwellers as pests in their way. This invasion focuses on the Lich Queen opening a portal from the astral plane to the material world and sending a massive fleet of astral ships loaded with thousands of soldiers and weapons of war. Red dragons take to the sky, helping the Githyanki invade all the kingdoms and burning any resistance to ash. This incursion might be a backdrop for a level 1 to 20 campaign as the party slowly pushes the Githyanki out of the world and then take the fight to the Lich Queen in the Astral Plane, defeating her greatest warriors and maybe ending her tyranny over the Gith Yankee. Released alongside Dragon 309 was Dungeon 100, and in this milestone edition, the adventure The Lich Queen's Beloved by Christopher Perkins combines the information from Incursion and provides the endgame campaign for high-level play. In this adventure, the party is given the challenge of infiltrating the Gith Yankee city of Ternara, built on the body of a dead god, and take on the Lich Queen Velakith 157, direct descendant of the original Velak, destroying her phylactery. In the 2004 Expanded Psionics Handbook, a revised and updated book to the 3E Psionics Handbook, 
The two Gith races are given information so that they can be played as player characters. Gith Yankee are self-assured in their abilities, arrogant and cruel of other races, and always are seeking ways to increase their power and wealth. They are given a plus two bonus to their dexterity and constitution, while their wisdom takes a minus two penalty. The Gith Sarai, on the other hand, laconic and quite suspicious of others, are expecting the worst out of events and other people. They really form attachments with others, and they realize that they can only rely on them. They are given a major plus six bonus to the dexterity, plus two to their wisdom, but take a negative two penalty to their intelligence, making it so they trust their intuition and really think about things too long. The 2004 Planar Handbook features the Githyanki city of Tunara, describing in great detail where to go and what to do when you visit. Not that Githyanki allow outsiders who don't have special. Built on the remnants of a dead god, it is split into a variety of distinct sections based on where you are in the body. A city made of iron and stone, its architecture reflects their militaristic society and is tightly packed and teeming with Gith Yankee. The various districts include space for artisans, the military, merchants, farming, and even a large section for Red Dragon. There is also information on a powerful artifact queen controls known as the Scepter of Amphelamon, which is what allows the Gith Yankee to get along with Red Dragons. If it were to be destroyed, their pack would dissolve and the red dragons would be free of their services. And because of that, you shouldn't be too surprised when you learn that the Lich Queen always keeps this scepter on hand. In the 2006 source book Complete Psionics, the prestige class Zert Cenobite is released as yet another way to play the Gith Yankee or Gith Zura. This prestige class is linked to the monastery Zert Adlon and is a reprinting of what was found in Dragon Magazine 281, though the mechanics are slightly updated to the new version of 3E. The racial abilities for the Githyanki and Gith Sarai are just like the one presented in the article, making it so that you can take racial levels alongside your class level, making it so that you can only become 18th level in your class, but gain more powerful Gith abilities than if you took the options in the planar hand. A few additional Gith Yankee are detailed in the Monster Manual for 2006, which provides information for Gith Yankee soldiers, Gish, and Gith Yankee captains. The soldiers are considered the common fighting force of the Gith Yankee, though they prefer to fight on their own terms in any ambush. The Gish are war wizards who blend magic and martial ability into a singular form, often leading small squads of soldiers into battle, though they often stick to the rear where they act as support. Githyanki captains are the ones who lead the raids against other settlements, often on the back of a red dragon. The older the dragon, the higher rank the captain atop of it. Their lore doesn't change, but rather we do learn that none of the Githyanki have any idea that Balakith is consuming the powerful Githyanki. They simply know that she summons the best among them, probably granting them special tasks, and because they have no idea what she truly does, she has been allowed to rule over them for a thousand years. Their culture is one of self-sufficiency, and they have no desire to worship a deity, although that isn't stopping Balakith from trying to ascend to godhood. Even Gith, the one who led the revolt against the Mind Flayers, is only revered as a great heroine, and never someone worth worship. The Gith first appear in 4th edition in the Monster Manual released in 2008, and each race has three distinct stat blocks pulling on lore from the previous editions. Nothing changes from what we know about these creatures, the Gith Yankee are still being the brutal xenophobes they have always been living on the Astral Sea, and the Gith Sarai, their monastic cousins, are now hiding out on the Elemental Chaos, which swallowed up Limbo in the 4th edition. The Gith Yankee warrior is the frontline fighters of the Gith Yankee forces using their telekinetic ability to grab onto their enemies so they can stride up and start laying into their mobilized targets with ease. The Mind Slicer prefers to stick to the sidelines, where they use their psionic powers to blast their opponent's mind, scattering their thoughts and making it more difficult for them to fight effectively. The Gish is an elite warrior that combines ranged and melee strikes to destroy their enemies. They conjure stars to shoot out at their enemies and then strike out with their weapons once they soften up their foe's defenses. The Gith Yankee are rarely found fighting alongside other creatures, but occasionally they will have a red dragon as an ally. The Gith Zerai, while slightly weaker than the Gith Yankee, are still impressive warriors on the battlefield, using their monastic training to bring down enemies. The Cenobite are natural warriors, striking at enemies with their fists and causing them to be stunned, while the Cenobite's allies just swarm around them while their target is helpless. The Zerth, on the other hand, will stick to the edges of the battlefield, but instead of just throwing ranged attacks in, they pick and choose what opponents they want separated, and then teleport them to the outside of the battle. This could be to get them alone so all their friends can beat them down, or simply so that they force the opponent to have to run back into battle from far away. 
The last of the Gisarai warriors are the Mind Mages, who refuse to get their hands dirty and simply blast out with their mind or hurl bolts of elemental energy at their enemies until you finally give up. Since the Gisarai now reside in the elemental chaos, they have a much closer relationship with the primal elements and can even be found hanging out with elementals. Speaking of the elements, in the 2008 Manuals of the Plains, the Gisarai are given a bit more information about their new home in the elemental chaos. They are not native to this realm of entropy, but rather fled to here when they split from the Githyanki. They have set up settlements across the elemental chaos, though they aren't particularly welcoming to travelers, but are willing to give aid unlike many others out there. In the largest of their settlements, Zerthadun, many Githsarai spend their time meditating on the balance of order and entropy, testing themselves against the chaos that swirls around them and threatens to destroy everything. The city is constantly being attacked by the Ifridi and the City of Brass, but it has held strong for thousands of years with no sign of it falling soon. The Gith Yonki also make an appearance and continue to be a race of cruel people that believe all others are inferior to them. They are one of the major dangers of the Astral Sea, leading raids and attacking ships for the glory of combat and to prove their strength over others. Many Gith Yonki are seeking portals in the Astral Sea so that they can continue their war against the Gith Sarai and the Mind Flayers, though they aren't particular if they happen to take down a merchant's astral skiff. Tunarath is still the greatest of the Githyanki settlements and is still ruled over by the Lich Queen, Vlakith. Few outsiders are ever allowed to see the settlement or even know where it is, and those that do visit are restricted to only a single section in the city. Those that try to skirt these laws or share information with others are killed in as painful a manner as possible. Leading up to the release of the Player's Handbook 3 in 2010, when the Gith's Ride became a player character option, Dragon number 378, released in August 2009, provides a look at how to roleplay as a Gith's Ride. Strangely, options to play as a Gith Yankee never come out, probably because they are made out to be irredeemably evil. The Gith's Ride and Gith Yankee were once a singular race under the grasp of their Mind Flayer overlords, forced to be a feeding stock to be used for hard labor and even the subject of psionic experimentation. Many believe they look nothing like the Forerunners, the people they were before being enslaved by the Mind Flayers, and have lost all of their history from before their oppressors. As the Mind Flayers grew more powerful, they also grew more complacent. They allowed the Forerunners to grow more numerous and failed to realize that they had developed secret powers and cabals. There were rebellions before, but they all failed until a warrior, Gith, rose out of the ranks of a rebel force and was able to achieve victory after victory against the Mind Flayers. The more she won, the more of the Forerunners that she was able to save and the fewer Mind Flayers she was forced to fight against. It took years and decades of hard-fought wars before the Mind Flayers were so depleted in numbers that they were little threat to the Forerunners, but still she refused to stop this genocide against the former oppressors. This was when Xerthamon rose to oppose her. He taught the Gith that their crusade was just another form of bondage, that Gith, despite all she had done for the race, was becoming a cruel tyrant that would force all of them to serve at her pleasure. She didn't take this threat to her power well and struck down Xerthamon and attempted to destroy all his teachings. This fractured the race, those who served Gith became the children of Gith or the Gith Yankee, while those who followed Xerthamon became those who spurned Gith or the Gith Sarai. They warred for decades until they tottered on the edge of oblivion and the two sides retreated. The Gith Yankee to their astral fortresses and the Gith Sarai to their monastic traditions and the elemental chaos. Xerthamon's teachings remain a major tenet for the Gith Sarai and give all Gith Sarai monasteries and settlements a common philosophical agreement. This allows them to easily work together with each other even if they practice Xerthamon's teachings in different ways. Some believe in following the spirits of the Forerunners, seeking out the lost knowledge of who they once were so they might better understand who they became, while others are focused on finding balance in the chaos, seeking ways to guide their race to a union with the Gith Yanki. No matter what a Gith's Rai follows though, they all hold the teachings of Xerthamon in high esteem and respect. In Player's Handbook 3, the Gith's Rai are a playable race and their statistics make them a perfect candidate for all psionic classes released in this sourcebook. They gain boosts to their wisdom as well as either dexterity or intelligence, they get some defenses against metal effects that would leave them confused or controlled by others, and they also gain the ability to use their mind to protect them from harm. 
An answer that has been burning in us since we first saw the Gisarai is finally answered, and it's that they purposely grow their beards in weird ways and keep it carefully maintained. It's apparently a point of pride for a Gisarai male to shave their head and grow facial hair in patches, while the women either wear their hair in very tight buns or decorate them in braids with beads. We're glad they finally mentioned their weird hairstyles, we were a bit too scared to ask directly. In the plane below, Secrets of the Elemental Chaos released in 2009 and in the plane above, Secrets of the Astral Plane released in 2010, the Gith are given even more focus to their settlements and societies. The Githsarai in the plane below are striving to perfect themselves, trying to reach a type of enlightenment that will harmonize themselves with the universe. The Gith Yankee in the plane above, which takes much of the information presented in Dragon number 377, released in July 2009, are still focused on living a heavily regimented life of violence. They act more like they are soldiers in a great war than like a true civilization of freed people, which earns them scorn from the Githsarai who think they are too scared to face finding their way through individuality. The books also reveal more information about the struggles between Zerthamon and Gith that when they battle against each other, Zerthamon wasn't actually killed. Instead, he won the battle against Gith, but spared her life, allowing her to live while he and his allies fled to the elemental chaos to be free of her tyranny. Zerthamon's final fate is largely unknown, but it's said that he led his followers for decades before one day he simply disappears. Some think he found a greater form of enlightenment, joining with the multiverse and becoming a divine form of pure energy. Others think he simply died, as all mortals will, and that has been so long that history has made the events muddled. The last idea of his whereabouts is that when he came to the end of his life, he took part in a horrific ritual to extend his life and become a lich, much like Git. Realizing he had become that which he had fought against, he exiled himself to a forgotten place in the chaos where he dwells still. Gith, on the other hand, has a much more defined story. When she lost to Zerthamon, she brought her people, the Githyanki, to the Astral Sea where they could gather up their forces and continue their war against the Mind Flayers. Realizing her people would need allies, she approached her advisor, Vlakith, and asked for her counsel. Vlakith had long thought on this and had already decided that they should join in with Tiamat, a goddess of vengeance herself, who could help them continue their unending war. Blacketh then met with Tiamat and made a pact that granted support from the Chromatic Dragons and in exchange, Tiamat would gain Gith's soul and all the souls of future Gith Yankee leaders like Blacketh. Even the Lich Queen, Vlacketh the 157th, owes her soul to Tiamat upon her death, though she has been constantly fighting against that eventual end and her transition to a Lich has further kept her alive for far longer than she should have been. Some of the Githyanki think she is being clever, but others worry what this might mean to their pact with Tiamat and how it might change things for them. Regardless of what they think of her being a lich, all worry what might happen if the Lich Queen becomes a goddess, as many believe that that is her ultimate goal because then she would become just as bad as those who enslaved the Forerunners long ago, demanding their worship to her. The Githyanki would be split again, this time with those who follow the Lich Queen in her godhood, and those who carry on the memory of Gith, who fought against all slavers and oppressors. Found in the 2014 Monster Manual, the Gith Yankee and Gith Sarai are both introduced, and their lore remains the same with a few changes here and there. Bakalith, the evil Lich Queen, still rules over the Gith Yankee with an iron fist on the astral plane, though this time it is the original Bakalith and not a descendant, which makes her terrifyingly old. The Gith Sarai are back living on Limbo so that they can better sharpen their minds and rely on the teachings of Zerthamon. The Gith Yankee enjoy fighting in close combat and have a few psionic abilities that allow them to teleport closer to their enemies as they carve through them with their great swords. As the warriors get stronger, they may eventually become a knight, arming themselves with a plus three silver great sword and gaining the ability to plane shift and use telekinesis. The Gith Sarai monks are those just starting on their journey to enlightenment and have a few psionic defenses to protect them from attacks. They enjoy punching things, and as they get more in tune with their philosophy, they become stronger and gain the title of Zerf, which allows them to plane shift and tap into the power of illusions to kill their opponents. The beginnings of the Yet don't change much from the previous editions, though in Mordekainen's Tomb of Foes, we find out that Zerthamon does not survive the confrontation with Gith, the original rebellion leader against the Mind Flayers. He was struck down in their conflict, but another Githsarai, Menyar Ag, the great Githsarai, 
led the exodus of the Githsarai into limbo and is still alive to this day. Menyar Ag resembles a decrepit corpse, but his mind is quite alive and is capable of tremendous feats of magic and psionics. Not only do we find out that Zerthamon dies, but we also learn again that the Githyanki are born from eggs, though it's never talked about for the Githsarai. One has to imagine that they have a similar method of reproduction. Since the Githyanki reside in the astral plane where no aging can occur, the eggs are brought to creches in the material plane and secret away, guarded by red dragons who are in service to the Githyanki until they become adults. Once the eggs are hatched, the young Githyanki are forced to fight and train until they are adults, with almost half of them dying before they get so far. When the Githyanki are ready to prove themselves and join the rest in the astral plane, they must hunt down and kill a mind flayer. No easy task since a mind flayer is CR8 and they are only CR3. Each warrior needs their own mind flayer, and so it may take them months before they can gather enough heads to present Devakalith and become a true member of the Gith Yankee. The Gith continue their war against each other, still fighting over the divisions that formed when Gith and Zerthamon fought. The Gith Yankee keep their strict hierarchy and one day hope to become the supreme leader of all the universe, much like how the Mind Flayer had assumed control and had been the supreme leaders for the eons of the Gith who were enslaved. The Gith Sarai simply wish to become balanced with the universe, living lives of rigid order and peace. There has been a new sect that came into existence trying to help the two reunite known as the Shashaku. They are a secret organization as neither side is interested in truly reunifying through peace, and so they are slowly trying to change the hearts and minds of the Gith Yankee and the Gith Sarai, though it is a slow process with little to show for their efforts so far. Since their conception, the Gith have been divided into the Gith Yankee and the Gith Sarai, each following a philosophy that controls their life. The Gith Yankee rely on following their Lich Queen and her orders in life, never truly throwing off the shackles of being oppressed, even if they are being oppressed by their own people. The Gith Sarai also struggle with finding their individuality. They are fighting against the chaos and entropy of the multiverse, slowly honing their bodies so that they will never become oppressed again. Between these two, neither has truly found a way to survive at peace with the multiverse, as they are controlled by their past, when they were once slaves to the Mind Flayer. Even now, they spend their waking moments planning revenge against them, hunting them down, and allowing themselves to be consumed in hatred to deeds enacted against them eons ago.